This is Space Cats Peace Turtles, the unofficial podcast for Fantasy Flight's Twilight Imperium. Episode 39, Five Player Games. Music by Ben Prunty, featuring Matt Martins and Hunter Donaldson. Well, uh, did you like that we used uh, some Let me copyrighted tell you. music? Okay. <laughs> Here's a problem that I want to bring up. In the last up. episode, uh, is that something that you yeah. enjoyed? Yeah, how about the bill in the mail that I got from Frank Black? <laughs> uh, you, you, are you going to share in that with me? Um, Frank Black, lead singer and of songwriter the of the Pixies. Uh, yeah, we owe him $12.5 million. Uh, that's copyright not, infringement that's not how is that no work. joke, Hunter. That's you don't, not... No, this is not a joke. This is not a bit. I owe Frank Black... How much money did I just say? What did 12. I say? Twelve point five million dollars. How yeah. much you said? I, um, uh, so if you're just listening to Space Cats for the first time, uh, last episode, me and uh, Alex Lilburn, uh, who is a frequent cl- collaborator with mm-hmm. the show, uh, without even asking Matt if it was cool, inserted oh, a man. little bit of copyrighted music. Oh my gosh! And oh my god, our lawyers are a buzzing. Oh, boy, let me tell you. <laughs> Our, lo- our lawyers. Lawyers, yeah. We have a yeah. team. We have, we have a, a whole team. team. There are a bunch uh, of rats that live <laughs> underneath my apartment. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Space Cats Peace Turtles. Yeah. Hey, you know what's fun about this week's episode? What? It's a Galactic Council episode. Not everybody always knows this, but the Galactic Council knows this. We, earlier this week, put out uh, a call, a request for types of episodes people mm-hmm. wanted to listen mm-hmm. to. And then later in the week, we did a vote. Uh, these are people who are contributors to our Patreon. If you yeah. contribute five dollars or more, you get to vote on episodes like this. So today, later on, in a little bit, we're going to talk about five-player games. Yeah. Of Twilight Imperium. Yeah. What what games. is different from a five-player game compared to what we typically talk about, which is the six-player? Yeah, game. this is a six-player game podcast normally. Yeah. But we're going to just kind of talk about the idea of five players. And I mean, we've always kind of teased the you know first round strategies for five players, right. and then no. eventually <laughs> the first round strategies for four players. Please no. And first Please. round strategies for three. No, no, no. And then once they get two in there, man, when we get a two-player game, there is a two-player fan. Variant. variant. Oh, yeah. What you is that You and I called? are going to play the, the princess variant. The princess variant. We're going to do that someday. I don't know. We're going to do a stream but of that for sure. before we talk about five-player games, uh, we kind of wanted to, to change the cycle a little bit. Today, it's been a very busy day for Hunter and I. We're recording oh, yeah. this very late in the day. Uh, but we played the Game of Thrones board game. Yeah. And we have teased the idea of this in the past, and it's, it's something we are wanting to gear up towards doing, uh, but we do want to have episodes where we talk about other board games. In relation to TI. In relation to TI. This is always going to be a Twilight Imperium podcast, so don't think we're going to become another one of those podcasts that just, like, every week we talk about a new game. I'm not right. interested in that. Hunter's right. not interested in that. Right. We don't play enough different board games to do that, but we do like to do what we do on this show, which is dig really deep into heady board games right, and, right. and come at them from that angle. I just wanted to see if we could smell a little Christian T. Peterson in there. Yeah, I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. I sniffed or outside Corey. and I was like, yeah. Corey Knixa? A little, little Corey Knixa. Right. If we could kind of see um, their their touch their on DNA. it, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, and the I touch bet, of I mean, an angel. We're going to, I feel like what we're going to do is create a whole system of board game critique, uh-huh. an auteur system where... The board game designer yes. is their is the influence. Primary focus. Yeah. We're going to change the name of the podcast to Space Christian Peterson T. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just going to be, we'll just do anything that Christian P- T. Peterson has done, including, and we'll get into this A in the Rada, retrospective. Oh, yeah. But we are uh-huh. going to have to watch Midnight Chronicles. Yeah, I'm excited about that. We'll talk about, about that. Later. Yeah, let's, well, let's talk, talk about Game of Thrones. Let's talk about Game of Thrones. What uh, variant did we play? We should talk about that. So this is the second edition that we played. Second edition. The one everyone plays like games. Uh, and we played with the A Feast for Crows uh, expansion, which normally, Game of Thrones, is a territory control game. There mm-hmm. are certain locations on the map that everyone wants to control seven of. Right. So once someone gets their seventh, game over, you win. But the Feast for Crows variant takes that away. I'm super glad for this because I think territory control games can get really boring. exhausting. Boring, when, I think. Because it's just, it's a tug of, it's a tug of war. Endless tug of war. sometimes you, can you never end. see the ending, if it, if, if. You see the ending kind of looming in the distance, yes. though. That's the thing, is there's never, like, a sudden, like, 
<gasps> yeah, like, it's, it's just there's very rarely swings. And it's always going to come down to one very large battle. And I always feel like in st- strategy games, I get tired of just like plastic be plastic. Yeah. Like I want other forms of interaction, which so, this, d- this version of the game does have. Yeah, so, so you get... Um, with the four factions that you play with, which you play with Lannister, Stark, Baratheon, and then they added House Aaron. Right. House Aaron is not normally in the Game of Thrones board game. They added it for specifically only this variant, and it comes with objectives. Right. Instead of just like hold territories, there are com- there are objectives you need to complete. Right. Each faction has a basic objective that only they can complete and they can complete it once every single round and then everyone has a hand of three objectives that are secret that you're trying to fulfill and most of them are still territory control related Mm -hmm. but it is more about specific destinations on the map as opposed to just like get as many forts as you can a lot of them are like control this territory and this territory right um well, what did we do in our game? What what was the player makeup in our game that kind of uh, changed things a little bit? Let's do a, give a quick shout out to uh, <laughs> Tiffany pa- McGuire, yes, and and Patrick Schmaltz. Yeah, uh, Tiffany McGuire is a fellow comedian with Hunter. She's she's newer to the scene, right? She she took a class this last year. There's there's the Portland. Come on, I wanted to say this. The Portland yeah. comedy scene is really cool, and they do like classes and stuff. And I knew Tiffany. Tiffany worked with me in film. And now Tiffany does comedy. Yeah, she's and making the jump. Uh, she's she's out there working on her stuff. I don't know if she has any videos on YouTube that know. you can check out. Uh, she's quite funny, and she likes to play board games, so she came over. Uh, she had never played before, and neither had Patrick. Yeah, and Patrick also has a podcast. He does a podcast with his two brothers called The Brothers Geek. Uh, and they talk about every single nerdy thing that I am not equipped to talk about. They talk about a lot of, like, Marvel movies and... Marvel movies? What are those? What do you mean? You're talking about the mouse? <laughs> You're talking about the mouse. Talking We're about talking about Mickey the mouse, mouse? again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so those two had never played Game of Thrones board game ever. Mm-hmm. Hunter has played. I played one once. game and I won, which yeah. I like to say over and over. Sure. But. Uh, and I used to play quite a bit, actually. Um, I, I've always played lots of Twilight Imperium, but there was a period in my life where I was playing one or two games on tabletop simulator of a Game of Thrones board game every week. Right. I was playing on the weekend a lot. There was there's a pretty good community on Tabletop Simulator. I don't know if it's still around. I haven't caught up with any of those guys, but uh, I used to play quite a lot. Um, not enough to be as uh, confident in strategies as I am with Twilight Imperium, right. and that's something I would like to get to. I would love to play it more where I can really dig into stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, but I had played significantly more than everybody else at the table. Right. Well, and then I think the real, the hardcore mistake we made yep. was that we... We had you and Tiffany positioned in a way to where Tiffany, like the way the game, well, okay, so a difference between Game of Thrones board game and Twilight Imperium is that Game of Thrones starts with a consistent board state that's already set up for you. Similar to Axis and Allies. You already have plastic on the board, and I think anyone who loves TI, uh, you know that this is just not as much fun. Like, I mean, it it just comes with a lot more baggage. It's interesting from a tactical perspective because, yes, you can have a... A first round strategy in Game of Thrones is actually a much bigger topic than what we did for Twilight Imperium. For Twilight Imperium, we're kind of like, here's a bunch of variables you need to consider. With Game of Thrones, a first round strategy would literally be a, an, an order like of there would operations. be an opening. Yes. Like it would be like, here's the specific opening right. that you do. It'd be like, I don't know if you got, if, if anybody's into Twilight Struggle, the way that game works is there is a consistent board state with, oh my God, I love that game so much. Um, <laughs> and that game is so consistent to where people have done play by plays, yep. do this, then this, yes. then this. Yeah, I'm not saying you could do that as consistently with Game of Thrones, but like probably, Pretty like there's probably, a, probably room for it. Yeah. So um, I was playing as Lannister. And Tiffany was playing as Baratheon. Hunter was Stark. Patrick was House Aaron. If you know anything about Game of Thrones board game, in the four-player expansion, Baratheon and Stark, their faction objective... Baratheon and Lannister. What did I but say? Anybody, Baratheon and Lannister. Anybody who doesn't listen or doesn't know matter. anything about Game of Thrones. There are two like factions that you can play as where their consistent victory point goal is the is, same. Is the same goal. Yeah. And we put Matt in one of those positions yeah. and Tiffany McGuire, who had never played the game before, yeah. in the other position. So and guess put, who consistently uh, achieved the objective? And we put <laughs> Tiffany in the notoriously more difficult right, position. Yeah. There's like the easier spot and the harder spot. <laughs> yeah. We really just drop a ball, we, yeah, honestly. Bad, bad. It was a bad game. It was not yeah. especially it fun. It should have been because I ran you in the hard spot, yes. me in the easy spot. Spot, yeah. And I just crush you, and that would have been great. 
that would have made it fun. No, but I would have no. been in the hard spot, and I'd still crush you, and okay, I'd still brag sure. about it. The point, though, being I ran away with it, but not even in a way that's like, that's not to say a brag. He, that's he, a failure of how we set up the he, game. Like, I mean, like, I, I had, had seven four points. points, he had seven, and then Tiffany, Tiffany Patrick and Patrick zero. had zero points. So. It was very bad. Yeah. Uh, but... We wanted to talk about some of the immediate differences. Uh, we don't want to talk about this very long, because again, this is something we'll get way into later. But mm. it is worth pointing out like how much more tactical something like Game of Thrones is. Like we already said, you can have an order of operations for your first round. Right. But even more so, there's not that many random variables that come up. Right. The only random variables are, well, in this variant, the objectives that you draw and planning for what your opponents are going to do. That's the only other unexpected thing that can happen. <gasps> I didn't think you were going to take Moat Kaelin. What, what, since right. when do you need Moat Kaelin? And that is where your It does a diplomacy style. In. If you've ever played diplomacy, it does a diplomacy style planning phase where you don't know what everyone else right. is going to do. And you're kind of all, it's kind of all, it resolves in a very specific order, but it's also sort of all happening at once. Right. You don't get to change your mind, basically. Right. You commit your troops to do something and then they're going to do that. Right. Um, so I will say the reason I like this variant is because I think the base game, like I already said, it's, I don't like how rigid pure territory control games can be. Right. Um, but to that same end, the objectives do make it feel like TI where sometimes, like the other reason I ran away with this game is I had perfect objectives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, I already wasn't going to have to try very hard. Right. Right. And so... Um, that is a big deal, and for some people that is like a... I mean, I, I don't feel like anybody listening to this podcast has that issue mm -hmm. with these types of games, that, like random objectives that sometimes right. you get lucky with. Right, right. But it is something to point out of like, A, it's a big similarity. It seems like something Corey Conexa and Christian T. PC, T. Peterson are into, uh, just the idea of like variable right. goals. Um, but it is a it is a weakness... It is a form of weakness in design. It's something right. to be criticized. It's something, it's something you could critique with them. Yeah. I will say this. I feel like it's worse in Game of Thrones than it is in Twilight Imperium. I feel like they definitely Because there aren't as many that. other variables. Right. So if TI, there's so many random variables right. that the crazy different objectives you could be getting is just one of the many things that could mess you up. Game of Thrones, everything else is like perfect math. Right. And then you're going to also just get random objectives. It does feel it out of place. Out more. Yeah, yes. it feels more like, uh, oh my god, well, this draw is... The yeah. whole thing. It's easier like, to lay the, the blame game. for yeah. your whole game on that. Yeah. Um, uh, what's something we liked, though, that we don't see in Twilight Imperium that we think would be interesting? Uh, no dice rolls. Yeah. That's, that's one interesting. thing. Uh, but more importantly, the the faction objective that can be scored every round is such an interesting idea. And even if it was, I want TI faction objectives. Right. Even if it's just one, and maybe you don't have to score every single round. Maybe it's right. just a one-time thing. But I think when when TI three introduced faction technologies, that was something I personally had never even considered as like a thing. Right. Um, but then when it was introduced, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so flavorful and so interesting. And um, I know that the Shard of the Throne variant has a version of faction specific objectives, but it's not quite as clear cut as this. And I would love, I mean, just imagining all the different like what could an X Cha specific goal be and I, w I think these would be like this could be a two or even three point goal where it's something like the only way you score it is if you achieve the height of what your faction is capable of i think also it could be a really useful way to kind of like counterbalance some of the factions like think about like joel nars could be like you have to research every tech right <laughs> like something right, that exactly. like oh that's really hard things um, things that pull you away from the other focuses of the game and make right. you dig in to what your faction But then, does. like, Sardak Nors could be easier than that, you know? Like, right. something... Something to help balance the problems we have also, with certain factions. Also, it could be it could be a useful tool for teaching um, what I really liked about it for Game of Thrones, um, is that if... Well, now I'm gonna say... I'm gonna... Uh, I'm gonna dunk a little bit on sure. Tiffany and Patrick That's right fine. now. Uh, but basically what I'm gonna say is that I, I felt like the point of those objectives, the house objectives, were... To kind of tell you what to do a little bit, yeah, give you an absolutely. idea of like Steer what you in the right direction. what your faction is supposed to do. And for TI, I actually think that would be really useful as a tool to just kind of like let the players know that hey, this is if you do this, you're gonna get rewarded yes. for it. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I like that it. 
what is annoying about it is, like we said, that two of the factions have effectively the same goal. Right. Which means that the other two factions at the table Don't. can just do whatever they, like, Right. they're not actually even steered in that difficult of a direction. Right. Whereas, like, okay, so you have two players that are guaranteed to be butting heads the entire game, and then two people that are just sitting, l- letting it happen. No I mean, incentive to get in the way. When I won, the first time we played a long time ago, when I won, it was you were a, house Aaron. A sit, yeah, it was yeah. a sitting pretty, not doing a whole lot of anything, right. really. I yeah. mean, I had a fairly like passive game experience. Right. Yeah. Very um, similar to, like, uh, Soul got the early expansion good, and now they just sit on right. all the planets You're just sitting have. around, waiting for people to try and unseat you, and they can't, they can't. do it, yeah. basically. Yeah. I don't want to harp on Game of Thrones too much right now. Is there anything else that I think stuck well, out to you? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, and I, I, I'm I, down to move on. I just kind of wanted uh, to kind of teaser For this sure. idea a little bit. And I, if, if you thought this was interesting, even though I know we're talking about a board game that you weren't necessarily prepared to listen sure, to, sure. Um, let us know. Because I think we're both kind of interested in doing a TI perspective, yeah. looking at other board games kind of thing. Yes. And Game of Thrones is just kind of something it's we had perfect, on hand. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's the perfect first game to do because it is very similar in right. you can scope feel its and DNA. theme yeah. and, and designers and everything. I mean, right. same company, same designers. So we want to do that someday in the future. And also just to put the call out of like, I want to get more games of it in. A Feast for Crows Game of Thrones can play very fast. Right. I mean, you, I have played... The six-player game can go on forever, but the the four-player A Feast for Crows variant, you can be done in two and a half hours if everyone right. knows what they're doing. Um, so that's the invite for me to let's play on Tabletop Simulator. Any of you listening to this? Like, yeah, hit us we up. Wanna, we want to play more games of it so that we can eventually talk about it more in Also, depth. I just got to get better at using Tabletop yeah, Simulator right. to do and all it is, kinds of stuff. It is easier to use Tabletop Simulator in other games. Twilight Imperium is... Particularly, particularly well, difficult. there's so many different components. There's so many components. So well, let's get to our real episode. Galactic Council episode. Yeah. Five player games. What about them? What up? Uh, we got five people. We we brought three extra people in here, and they're not going to talk, but they're <laughs> they're, they're sitting they're, here nodding in approval. We're doing everything a, we a say. five player podcast right now <laughs> to kind of get us in the zone of what it means to have five yeah, people doing definitely. something. Um, so let's talk about. Um, this do we like them? Do Are, we they even, fun? Is, Are they good? So <laughs> I used to have on my computer. I used to have a little. I don't know why I did this. I'm obsessed with just making Excel spreadsheets and charts and graphs and stuff. I made a little graph. It's his favorite thing. It's <laughs> this his is, favorite this thing. This is how to stupid this is. I made just a tiny graph that showed how much I like the different player variants of TI3. <laughs> I had a little graph that, that put them next to each other, and it's just like a little bar. Oh, graph. can you post this? Is this no? Somewhere? It's gone. Oh, man. I mean, it would be very easy to recreate. It would take me thirty seconds, probably. <laughs> it's not even that much of be anything attached as extra it's materials, so stupid, supplementals. I used to put uh, five player var- uh, five player games as my favorite. I, I liked them more than six player Weird. games. Yeah. Why? This was what my was pecking. Logic? This was my pecking order. I liked five player then six player, then three player, then four player. I think four player games are trash. I, I yeah, really yeah. hate playing four player games. Yeah, well, I, we don't but like them either. five player like games. Them. We, um, who am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like, I think this is more true in TI3, but this, this holds true somewhat for TI4. But I like five player games because I like how difficult some decisions can be to make. Mainly in only five strategy cards getting picked. For me, that's actually kind of fun. Yeah, uh, the, the idea that like there's gonna be a lot left off the table, and you got to make some hard choices. That's I true. was always very into that. Ti three, it was different because there was more mobility in Ti. There, there was just a lot more you kind of could do, sort of. Right. There's barring, gonna be barring the juicy... crazy exceptions to the rules, but like there there was just more you could accomplish in a round. Right. There's gonna be juicy stuff left on the court, basically right. every right. time. It's not you're not gonna just be like oh diplomacy construction okay yeah, I'm yeah. good like oh diplomacy construction I'm good oh diplomacy imperial oh well, you're right that's it like, no there will always be one strategy card where everyone's like oh, what? Oh. no trade yeah no trade this not, round i can't trade oh crap i was gonna count on that yeah for me i like that hunter you are not as into five player games uh no i don't really i i don't know i just it's like you only like six player games it feels that like actually is true <laughs> you uh, only want to play ti i with think six my feelings on ti is that it's like i just want to i just want you know what it's the same way i feel in a restaurant if I sit down and I order a dish at a restaurant, just give me it the way the chef wanted it. Like, you know what I mean? Right. You don't the want to do the the, you don't modify it. You don't want to say, no, also I don't add chicken mo- and take I, away the bell I want to eat it. Yeah. No, I don't modify the dish. Yeah. Give it to me the way 
they wanted me to eat yeah. it. Because the know? people at Olive Garden, they've really crafted the perfect, the How dare perfect you? How dare you? breadstick. And you How just want it exactly the way they got it. Listen, when that you're knows- there, you're family. <laughs> and I gotta, okay? My family's back in Arkansas, okay? Sometimes I need a little of that family I need a taste. Little family touch. And when you're there, you're their family. Yeah, the famously Italian Donaldson bunch. <laughs> when I go to Olive Garden and the waiter comes by, I goes, hey, Dad. <laughs> Give me a big old smooch. Uh, so, so not Hunter doesn't like five player games as much. I actually what? don't really. I just like six player. Yeah. Like, I really am just, just like a six do. player. I'll do the others, yeah. but I'm already kind of is like, there anything... this game is not perfectly set is there up anything that you do think is better, better about five player? Than five player uh i'm serious i don't hate it like this is making it sound yeah, like yeah, i yeah. really really no. hate it i just you feel do like hate it four is, player games i do hate four player games, you do not hate five i feel like five is the, the best thing i can say about it is it's like a half step or a whole step below six yeah. player yeah. that's how i feel about it right. just all around that's how i feel you will you will very often be okay with doing a five player no, game. i want I if want it drops loan, if it I drops want... to four player hunter is usually like well let's not even play what's the point mm. i don't even want to do it that's well i might as well leave so you guys can play three player right and, you know, <laughs> and just do and it real more fast. enjoyable yeah. yeah the idea of every i'm sorry to sidebar this just the idea that every strategy card is going to be picked every time it, like it's so gross it's honestly I really why i also hate eight player games in ti3 right that's why i never i mean i already think it's too long also but like i never want to seven was the limit for me right because i needed at least one strategy card to not get picked every Dude. single strategy card game picked kind of ruins the game for me just yeah it's like you you don't there's no you don't have to plan near as much right. it's a whole level of planning that you just you never just have to do yeah. anyways to, we, we will sidebar that. We'll eventually do a bigger episode on four-player games. But uh, I'll say this much about five-player games. Uh, it makes race drafting a little bit easier. Sure. 17 right. races doesn't quite mathematically help a six-player game. But mm-hmm. you can take 17 and get 15 out of it. You, everyone draws three or whatever. I don't know. It's, yeah. just, it's always yeah, yeah. easier to pick factions when there's going to be two left on the cutting room floor. You can just take out Jolnar and take out Winu, and now you've yeah. got a fairly even pick of right. things. Or take right. out Soul and Jolnar. Yeah, I was about to say. And see see what you get. Leave Winu in there. Leave Winu in Somebody there. Somebody might want to get it spicy. Um, so let's talk about the biggest difference with five-player games and the biggest challenge of five-player games. Uh, Twilight Imperium is designed around the hexagon shape. Right. Uh, and a hexagon Count them up, baby. has Count. six... Hey, pause the show. Okay. Pause the show. Count them up. We'll meet you. We'll be back. Da, 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 yeah, six da, sides, baby. Yeah, da, you, you have back. six sides of the hex. Uh, six does not equal five. Wait, you got what? a weird. Wait, what? Oh, uh, back six up. Six does not equal six. Wait, okay, so you said six sides, and now you're saying six does not equal five. Okay. Is that weird? I mean, I heard two plus two equals five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this leaves some really weird asymmetry on the table Mm -hmm. and that has been something the designers have had to grapple with and try to fix and so their solution if you've never played a five player game and you never paid like looked into the book to see what it is uh basically you're gonna have two players that are in kind of abnormal positions and then the other three players will be in the standard edges of the board but what that means is two people kind of have an advantage as far as like the the width of their pie slice right right they have a bigger slice uh, which means the person in that, we'll call it six o'clock position, the per- that that person is more pincered in mm-hmm. than anyone else. There's two players with a lot of room. There's two players with not much room on one side, but plenty of room on the other side. Right. And then you got one player that has a really a standard pie slice. So right. it's not that much to moan about, but it is different. So the way the game decided to balance that is give six o'clock four trade goods and give seven o'clock and five o'clock two trade goods right and the other two players get nothing right uh hunter how do you feel about the trade good method i really don't like it um because it 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 negates all of our hard work on designing first round strategies it does destroy all of our first round strategy guides (laughs) that might actually surprise some of you but if yeah, no, none of those apply to if you start with yeah. four trade goods. If you listen goods. to the Arborek episode, yeah, and then you play a game as Arborek where you start with four extra trade goods, you're you're good. You're good. You're fine. You're and I, be totally I would say fine. you're getting a fundamentally different experience. Yeah, because yeah. the point of Arborek, Arborek was specifically given the amount of money and the types of units they were given to balance them against everything else. Arborek can snowball. If you give right. Arborek an easy start, 
Guess it's what? A completely it's different a completely different experience. faction now. Yeah. So giving four trade goods to one player, that is a technology or a dreadnought in the first round of the game. Right. That's huge. Or two cruisers to Mentac or or like so many things can go crazy because you gave one player four trade goods. And honestly, having that level of good start, I mean, in the hands of a good player is I think much more um is actually such a bigger advantage than like oh you've got a little more neighbors than everybody right. else like you have one extra system in your pie slice right it's versus it's just a bigger deal yeah. to get because the beginning of the game start. is such a big deal the first right. round is a huge deal in twilight imperium right and so to give someone just like a you know colossally better start. running start yeah. running start is really what it is and yeah that four trade goods it's completely insane and and think about like the different factions that are already set up to be able to deal with the problem easily. Yeah. Like, let's say you've got Soul in the middle there. Right. Like, they're already set up to be Did hardy and defendable. Trade yeah, goods? and now they've got four trade goods. Like, it's just not... It feels like a very... It's not an elegant solution to right. the problem. It's a very, like, kind of crass Right. So solution. long has the community been on the lookout for a better solution. Just a solution, yeah. Something so, that is more fair. Um, this isn't actually... I don't know if this was originally developed by fans, but Fantasy Flight uh, is the ones who actually put this out. Many people know about the Warp Zone method. That's right. what it's commonly called. The Warp Zone method is effectively... You literally take one full pie slice out of the mix. Mm -hmm. That's one system adjacent to Mechatol, a system adjacent to that, and the system adjacent to that, which would be the previous old home system. Mm -hmm. The two other systems that would be adjacent to the home system and then one equidistant system. Right. You pull all of those tiles out, and you have effectively removed one pie slice. Then you treat all of you treat that blank space as if it makes the systems on either side of it adjacent to each other. This is something Fantasy Flight developed. This right. is not something that just like crazy people came up with. In right. the in the there's a preset maps booklet for uh, TI3, and in it, they detailed a way to do it. In the old days, you had to do it with, you had a bunch of extra warp zone tokens. You had an alpha, beta, and a C wormhole, and you made your own little warp zone out of right, everything. Right, right. Nowadays, people, you know, we, we made a little thing out of paper that you just cut out and you slip underneath the board, and it shows you where things connect. It's a little bit visually easier to see, but this has always been the main way people sidestep the five-player issue. It's better. I it, want to say that. Before it is we say absolutely else about it. better. It, it is much better. We have used that for most of our TI4 time. Mm -hmm. Only recently have we started to change things, and we'll get into those changes. But um, a lot of people really, really like it. I really, really like it. Um, the the things I like are the fact that it mathematically gives you the same pie slice you would have right. as a six player game. Your sl your slice is unaffected. You you don't right. have a better everyone or has worse slice. Four systems that are basically theirs, mm -hmm. and then two systems nearby that they share with somebody else. To a large extent, your first round, you can anticipate it the way you would anticipate a six-player game. Right. If you're playing a five-player game, and you're using the Warp Zone method, all of our first round strategies still apply. Right. 100%. They, are, they work fine. the exact same. However. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a however. What's the problem? What's you the problem? You are pulling... Four, five system tiles from the game. Right. And we don't have, we just don't have enough, yeah. basically, for that to always Right now, we have sense. almost exact, we have basically exactly enough tiles to make TI work. And so when you pull five out, <clears throat> here's the big thing. My advice to you, if you are going to play a warp zone method, you need to be very diligent about the five what system tiles out. that yeah. you take out. You mm -hmm. need to take out two reds and you need to take out two blues. Mm -hmm. Those two blues. Three blues, sorry. Those three blues that you pull out, here are some things you need to consider. Uh, there are only eight tech specialty planets, and there is an objective that is to control five. Right. If you pull out three planets that all have technology specialties, you have made it even, like, that's already a really difficult objective to do. You've made it impossible. Right. Um, no or one will ever... you could literally, I mean, you could, well, I guess you couldn't literally make it, could you literally make it impossible to accomplish? No, you could, okay. you, there's, there's only, there's never two in one right. T system, right, right. but regardless, if you pull three system tiles and each of those have one tech specialty in it, you have made it very, very difficult. Very, very what difficult. you can make impossible is if you pull only cultural planets out, this has happened to me before, mm -hmm. uh, I had a game where I was gunning for cultural planets, 
I didn't count out all of them on the map and then realize too late that there were only five, period. There were only five cultural planets right. on the map. And so I there was a control six planets of the same planet trait, and I had like three of the cultural planets pretty easily and then stretched myself thin to get two more and mm-hmm. then realized it was all for naught. I could never get the sixth cultural planet. So when you pull those planets out of the tile, out of the mix, you need to consider what it is you're taking out. Right. You need to generally take out one of each planet trait, or if there's going to be more than that, just make it very fair, control the tech specialties, and the other thing too is pay attention to if the wormholes are getting taken out. You could have a game where there's like basically no wormholes at all. If you take out one alpha and one beta, there's no wormholes. That's done. And that's boring. That's so boring. Now that, right. that happened a lot in TI3, but we actually house ruled that we would always leave the wormholes in, because I don't think the TI game board is very interesting if there's no wormholes. Right. I think it really right. kind of ruins the game. It's, it's necessity to the experience. Yeah. Um, so be very, very careful about which systems you're taking out uh, and make sure you don't throw off the entire balance of the game. And even if you... Nor- normally, because every player only has access to... You, you can only kind of be guaranteed what's in your home slice. This is still balanced, but other objectives can get broken. The control 11 planets outside of your home system in a five-player map with a warp zone pulled out, it, it is more difficult. Right. I don't. I think a lot of people try to argue that all of the objectives are more difficult because there's there's one less pla- there's one less but trait. That's not true. But that's not true because you already were going to have a hard time getting that planet trait, right? Because to, to, you were going to have to invade someone else's pipeline. Well, the slice. problem is that it makes the hard objectives harder, mm-hmm. and so it emphasizes the all of the ones. objectives that we don't even really care about right. that much. You know, <clears throat> exactly. like the ones that don't lead to spicy games. That's the problem that I feel like I have with the five player is that it in general is it feels feels like you set yourself up to kind of constrict the game as far as like what is possible within it yeah and uh yeah just making making the things that it makes difficult more difficult is sad because like those are the objectives i really like to see people score because they right. got to do a lot they gotta already. do a lot to do it yeah so uh the last thing about warp zone that is kind of tricky and this is an interesting problem with the warp zone but visually it's just tough to like understand if we're all used to looking at the map and knowing how things are adjacent when you throw this big empty spot in the middle of it but tell people well don't worry that system is actually adjacent to that one yes you can understand that and you can be really good at the game and like kind of get it but you're gonna mess it up you are and don't please if you're hissing right now don't hiss at us (laughs) because ti is hard i mean it is a lot to keep in your brain at once and to add this kind of extra contrivance like i mean i realize that you know for just straight up movement it's not super difficult but think about situations like like i'm extra and i'm in one of those pockets where i'm gonna have to deal with the warp zone a lot and i have to keep track of where my pds network can hit all the time yeah and it's across the warp zone like you're gonna mess it up like you you have so many other things to forget to fire your pds or something at least once and the other player is not going to remind you no you know no oh i mean maybe they will if they're a gentleman. Idiots. If they're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, gentlemen. Sorry. Yeah, gentlemen. If they're a gentleman yeah. or a uh-huh. lady. Uh-huh. Um, so Warp Zone isn't a perfect solution. Yeah. I don't know that we'll ever find a perfect no, solution No, it's not problem. made for five. That's the thing. Yeah. Chef didn't intend to eat it that way. Well, I'm going to have an argument that there is one method. But okay. we'll get to that. But sure. what, what are some things we've tried, Hunter? Um, well, here's an interesting idea we had. We decided to try a delayed... Uh, trade good distribution for those um, four trade goods, four and trade two goods, trade two trade goods. trade goods. What we tried was we just did it on round two. Um, it felt like so much to give that to someone round one. Right. That hugely changes the scope of the game. But giving them to, giving it to them after they've established it with what they were set up to establish it with, and then giving them four trade goods or mm-hmm. two trade goods. Uh, I liked it. It seemed more akin to like what you would actually experience in a game. Sometimes, like it, like. Starting on round one with the four extra trade goods, it's like this would never happen. Mm-hmm. Like you're never that's it, literally impossible. Yeah. But the idea of you having some sort of crazy swing on round two, I'm I'm not saying I'm not in love with the solution no. that I'm bringing out. I'm just saying we tried it and it felt a little bit better. It didn't feel as heinous right. as four trade goods on round, round one. one. Yeah. Uh, the other method, this is one we haven't tried, but when we tried this one, it still felt like a pretty big swing round two. It did. For someone it really to have four did. trade it really goods. Did. It, felt, it felt like a lot. Uh, so the other thing we've um, you know, had a theory about is what if we split it up? Mm-hmm. What if round one, at the beginning of the game, 
the six o'clock gets two trade goods and the right. two neighbors get one trade good and then you do it again at the beginning of round right. two now this still has the problem of throwing off the balance of round I'm one still, yeah i'm still not in love with it because it's very clear that a lot of the design of the game is based around the idea of how many exactly resources right. a faction has yeah so even those two i mean if it's the wrong faction that's going to Right. really change the way that right. faction to, feels. To, to put it into perspective, even if you split it up, but if you don't split it up, whatever, gaining four or two trade goods at the beginning, let's say the five trade good objective comes out. Mm -hmm. Like, if you already have two, all you need to do is be the person that takes trade. Right. And you are 100% guaranteed. I mean, you're already, in a lot of cases, if you took trade, you're probably going to get it because you're going to make some trades. Right. But at least you have to make the trades. You have to get adjacent to someone and put the work in. With these trade goods being available to you right from the get-go, you just have them, you take trade, you get three more, boom, I scored a point round one. God, and the, That's a big deal. Yeah, one right, point right. round one, having it already out of the way, that's like it a feel, huge deal. It feels like the solution of throwing trade goods at people, it creates a kind of chaos theory thing yeah. where it's just like this This could ripple out yeah. in so many different ways. Whereas Absolutely. like if it happens later, it's like it's just so much harder to even determine what's, what that is doing. But right. we can say for sure that... With certain factions, starting with four trade goods round one is just so going to be broken. completely different. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here's the last thing then that I, I think is the solution to this problem. Uh, hopefully it's the solution. Hopefully. I mean, we're bringing it out saying like we haven't done the work on this, but this sure. is an idea we're having. I think we're kind of bringing it out at, for you. Yeah. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> um, just play with a pre-made map. Yeah. Does, we need just somebody make a map and balance it for and i think five. someone i think there's at least one on the subreddit uh but we want something hunter and i want to be starting to do here going forward is we're probably going to start trying to make a bunch of maps or right. or getting more diligent about posting the maps we've played i mean you can always go to our twitter and just check out maps that we have right. played on and mimic them if you want but we want to get better about like this is a map that worked very very well so here it is community if you just don't want to build a map on your own because a lot of people don't but there's only I one honestly right and there's only one pre-made in the book and you don't want to play on the exact same map every right. single time right, right so having a bunch of pre-mades would be really great that's why the cartographer on uh the subreddit is so useful even though we as a community haven't fully started using it yet i i encourage everyone to when you play a good map and you thought that was a really good build post it post it on the reddit slash r slash twilight imperium mm -hmm. um but even that being said being able to design a map means well we can just balance for the fact that there is an imbalance in our how far we are away right, from right. other players so those two players that are further away from the other ones okay weaker slices let's just give them less stuff and, right. and now their resources and all that stuff is balanced off of each other sure they're still a little bit further away so they have less danger of like being invaded but mm -hmm. okay so let's get the wormholes up right. in their face exactly. like there is exactly. a lot at your disposal to where you can make a map that fixes those problems an elegant solution right. w just with the tiles that are there instead of bringing a whole cross-cutting trade good thing yes. into it that right. fundamentally changes right. so much you can keep the mechanics of the game consistent and just have people in different starting positions there must fine. be a way yeah. in mac we trust give us a cartographer of chaos please we need you we need you <laughs> We so, trust you. So honestly, this is us putting out the call like, hey, put, give us, let's see some five-player maps. I think I think it's something that more than anything, that's what five-player games need. Six-player right. maps, like, yeah, we can kind of build it and make balance and do some things. We don't need a bunch of pre-made six-player maps. But I think getting some good six-player, or some good five-player pre-mades is actually kind of important. So I would love I mean, to see more of those done. I, 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 I just want to see a place where I can go and just look at a bunch of different types of maps. Like, here's some maps that are made for people that are just starting the game. Yeah, yeah. Here's some maps Absolutely. that are designed to be insane. Like, when, in when Mac We, we Trust stream. made that one for the stream, Let me that tell was you. insane. In Mac We Trust just made us another one for a future stream that we haven't we don't know when we're doing it completely yet, completely bonkers the craziest like, map i've ever seen it's and I can't so wait. cool yeah it's literally um they got genius <laughs> like like in just the simplest trick to it yeah, too yeah. like oh he didn't God. have to do that much but yeah he pulled it off yeah uh, we'll get to that someday but um let, let's talk more about some some other differences here in the five player game we've already talked about this a lot but the biggest problem is it it can throw off a lot of the balance it, it feels like ti was built for six player games and then they added on three four and five well, as just, an addendum I mean I, I mean I get it it's like you're you're making this game and like you want 
you know, people like <laughs> you never you're not always going to get six people. to the Well, table. what's that pitch like? We have this game and you have to have exactly six people to play it. And it takes 10 hours, maybe right. and it's really hard to learn. Like how many barriers of entry did right. they had to have? Make? You know that I'm sure like, you know, and fans were going to make it up if not them. So like right. they might as well do it. So know? let's talk about uh, what are some factions that you think improve in a five player game? And let's first talk about let's say we're just doing the standard. Let's assume the pre-made map, there's no difference. We're, we would try to build a pre-made map that just keeps right, the balance right. the same. So let's talk about trade good methods. No matter what the trade good method is, who who seeks to gain from a five? Well, we've already map? called out Arborek. That's the biggest one for me, honestly. Right, right. that one's huge. Um, I mean, I think anyone that's already really great just gets better, like Soul or Jolnar. Yeah. Like People they don't, don't need that. They just advantage. don't need extra money. It's just gonna right. be crazy. People with great starts, the Yin Brotherhood, they don't need four trade goods. Right. You don't need to be able to get another carrier. Honestly, Jolnar is buck wild because they start with PDS. So like we're talking about like yeah they've got these close neighbors but they start with PDS yep. and they've got cash. Yep. Like it's just it's, it's too nuts much to me. Too much. Um, the Mentac m- is insane yeah. because that's four trade goods that they've got banked ready for when Mirror Commun- yeah. com- Computing comes out and a, then we're talking eight. A good, yeah, a good Mentac player will probably just hang on to those trade goods and to give someone at the start of a game eight resources or eight info that's an objective that's a right. lot of objectives right. that they could just score when they if they hold on to and mentech i feel like is balanced in that it there's a certain it takes them they have to negotiate a certain amount right. to get trade goods mentech and, has to, and to kind of in. throw that out yeah i mean hakan we're talking yeah could be we could we could be talking about 13 trade goods round one with or hakan. more like they could already be getting 13 and now you're gonna let them have 17 sar is completely yeah. Out of the question, yeah. insane. Yeah. Sar likes either situation. Right. If Sar is in that six o'clock position, a bunch of trade goods, great. I love it. Or Sar in this like empty part of the galaxy with just like a bunch of planets that they can openly roam. Are you kidding me? Right. That is a dream scenario. Right. Just not having to worry about getting carved up, but you know, you don't you don't want someone cleaning up your slug trail. Well that's there is not a bad spot you can be in as Sar on a five player map. But like, think about this, like even some of the some of the factions that have a tough start this doesn't even really help them no, that much it doesn't like, give you a like, leg up it's nice need. that sardak would get guaranteed a tech yeah. that's nice i guess um but it's not like it's going to change their world right. basically right um it is still... it is a win more sort of thing right and it doesn't pull up anyone it would else be crazy because technically Sar- sardak would be able to get if they took the tech strategy card, they would be able to research two tech this way, uh-huh. which would be that's a big deal. quite sweet. Yeah, uh, that's kind of tough to just assume that you're going to get the tech strategy card. Mm-hmm. I just mean that it's not even even yeah. the level of advantage that we're talking right. about. Right. So, um, what about our warp zone method? Um, I think. I mean, I think there are a lot of factions that actually get kind of goofed up on anybody that's like. I mean, I think extra we've already talked about with the PDS extra gets more it. difficult. I mean, really, sure. any PDS faction is going to or anything that, that relies on adjacency. Honestly, right. Mentac gets a little bit confusing when you play that's this warp true. zone. Yeah. Anywhere where that warp zone can throw off your understanding of where you're adjacent to things, that that can be a problem. And I've seen it happen. I've seen people play a game and like Mentac is on the edge of it, and they never really stole from the person on the other side of the wedge because. They just forget that they're adjacent where they're people adjacent. always forget little things like that. Like right. that's one of the nitpicky things that people forget. And like adding, yeah, adding another thing to that, it's, it's really difficult. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I feel like I. I also just don't really like the factions that I feel like are hindered by this. And I feel like it just really helps all the people that didn't yeah. need any help. Yeah. Everyone. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Every. The only people that really gain are the ones that definitely don't need right to get better. That don't need any help. Um. So I think the the last and and honestly biggest thing about a five-player game uh, is every round, only five strategy cards are getting picked. Right. In a six-player game, you pick six out of eight. In a four-player game, you pick eight all, all out eight. of eight, which is terrible. In a three-player game, you pick six out of eight. Right. So five-player is the only one where there's like a lot left behind. Right. And we, we kind of touched on this, but th- this is what I like a lot about it, but it is a, it's a huge deal. And I would say this is the number one reason people hate Five, five player, player games. games. There's a yeah. there's a lot of people out there who think five player is by far the worst, and I would say this is the number one culprit. Yeah, is three strategy cards being left behind. Like we said earlier, I mean, it leads to some really tough decision making, um, but also it does slow the game down. I mean, just the fact that less stuff is getting picked means no one's getting as much. Like there's gonna be rounds where just like tech just doesn't get picked, right? And that slows down objectives that you could be scoring. Literally, uh, it slows down the easiest objectives yeah, that you can get. Yeah. yeah, and this is interesting, but. 
a uh, thing to point out. We had I had two games in a row not that long ago. We talked about the two games where we saw eliminations. Right. I had two games back to back where players were eliminated. Both of those games were five player games, and you don't make you, up for yeah, the you, fact that now you have four players. You're not going to now start you don't picking start two. picking two. Yeah. So, so if a player gets eliminated in a five player game, you are only picking half of the strategy cards all game, which that sounds is so slow. Madness. That sounds so slow. It it the game came to a screeching halt, and yeah. it's just so it becomes it does become less fun. If Space that happens. cats slow turtles. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Ugh, um, but I I think. For me, you like the hard choice. I like the hard choices. Yeah. I think that's because that's TI to it. me. That is part of Twilight Imperium to me. Is is like constantly battling with a bunch of difficult things that you're up against. I'm just a curmudgeon. I just am right. used to a certain amount of like. I just don't like sitting down feeling like oh, this isn't usual. This yeah. feels like the flow of this is wrong. I right. feel like I'm just so used to a certain flow of the game and yeah. tempo. That any time I play a game that just doesn't have the right to... I mean, I'm really kind of getting addicted to the overall... Like, any game that... If I play a game and it's, like, eight hours, I'm like, this is outside of the norm. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, I yeah. want to hit that, like, six-hour right. mark Man, every we, time. We had a, there was a period there, and I don't know what happened, but we had a good little window close to the beginning of us playing TI. We were playing, like, four-and-a-half-hour-long games. It was nuts. What happened? I was getting so We've gotten excited. so much slower, but, but there was, like, a good month there in, like, I don't know, January, where yeah. it was just, like, boom, so fast, lightning fast. Well, games. I think we got better is really the problem. I think there was now a period where we were just it. warming yeah. up, and then now we've gotten to a point where, well, not only we, not just us. I mean, no, everyone, like people, our group. Our yeah, group has with... gotten better, so now it's a little bit challenging, but I feel like that six hour is the sweet spot. It is. I agree. Yeah. Um, so, and that's that's an interesting point to talk about the the length of a game differing from how many people are playing because mm-hmm. I don't think taking one player out actually makes a five player game. No, it shorter. doesn't. That's crazy. It can be a longer. game. That's crazy. That can that be your longest whole, game. N- there's a whole person missing as far as tactical actions yep. and like all like yeah that oh man yeah no nah, I. Uh, maybe maybe <laughs> i think five player is the worst I, don't know. I mean i definitely hate four player the most you definitely don't like three player either well yeah. you just a, t- a three player game just isn't twilight period right that's it just is like a different whole other board game. game in fact it's I think a fun it, board game but it is a completely different board game. i kind of wish that like that sort you know what i'm gonna i'm about to tie it all back here we go give it to me i wish that like in game of thrones yes the game was fundamentally different depending on I agree. How, the amount of players yeah. that you had. Why not? This Honestly, game's already so huge. Right. I wish more games did this in general. Yeah. Just that, that like, the player counts were not just like, oh, we'll slightly shift it so that it works. It's like, no, 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 t- change the game. Feel just free. Just do a different game. Re- yeah. I have always wanted... I, let me know, dear listener, if you know of this game existing. I have yet to find. I haven't searched that hard, so I'm not. I, I don't right. research a ton of Somebody's board games. Somebody's gonna be like, "No, dude, everybody it's knows just about this. that game." Uh, but <laughs> I want a three-player board game, a game that is mm-hmm. designed for three players in mind. Mm-hmm. Because to me, three players is the most interesting setup you can have. Right. Because there's always like one person left out, and I want a game that like balances that. Like when one person is left out of a deal, they get boosted up on their own. Like right. I want a game that constantly balances three pillars against each other right because a six-player game kind of feels like that in that you tend to sort of maybe buddy up with one person and the two of you rely on each other a little bit and then that happens three times and you have that sort of dynamic but it's not as just like graceful as what could a three-player game right if if the game was designed for with the intent of three players i don't know why this tangent just happened i like it we got to do some errata because I wasn't here last week, so let's. I want to jump over to the errata. Can we do that right now? Well, I just wanted to say real quick that I think it's a good idea oh, that thanks, you had. Man. I think it's Gee, really good. Thanks a lot. I think it's good. Oh, that's nice. Now we can jump over to the errata. Right. All right. Last week I wasn't here. Uh-uh. Well, oh. just because you weren't here last week doesn't mean that I get changed to do it. whatever I want. No, nah, I want. Welcome I, to Space you Cats Beast Turtles Errata. Two segments last. You got to host the show and you got to host the Errata. I got to host the whole thing. <sighs> I did it all by myself. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty Fine. sure the last episode was just me talking to me, <laughs> and it was great. Actually, I at one point I thought that's what I was gonna do. You uh, just thought, yeah, that's I true. Thought, there was thought, a moment. There was a moment where Hunter which was like, I guess been... I'm doing an episode by myself. <laughs> Like, yeah, good luck. See you, buddy. Which would have been so stupid, but whatever. I don't know. Maybe it would have been I fun. want that to exist. Right. I can't wait for the day where well, you Well, to... if you didn't hear last week's episode, we just talked about the idea of there being a Twilight Imperium movie, and the... I'm 
just glad that I'm not in charge, you know? Like, I'm glad that I don't have to come up with what we talk about yeah. every week. Yeah. Oh, also, thanks, Galactic Council. Yeah. You're really setting us right, but, you know, back, <laughs> on, the, back, on, back track. on track. Uh, yeah, when Hunter was left to his own devices, things got a little weird. Let's talk about uh, Rolo, Legend of the Cones, gave us some some pretty good errata. Yeah, this was from Reddit, this Twilight was, Hunter, what did you say? Okay, so what I said was I imagined uh, when we were, t- we were talking about the movie and, God, I'm so... I feel like I'm being I'm put on blast now for how <laughs> stupid of an idea we had. Um, but we were talking about if they made a Twilight Imperium movie, what, who would the director be? Yeah. And I jokingly threw out Christian T. Peterson and said, and said that he had never directed a movie before. Guess what? Guess what he has? <laughs> um, Christian T. Yeah. Peterson has never directed a movie? Clearly, you have not seen Midnight Chronicles. Drop what you're doing and check it out. Bring a bottle of liquor and take a shot whenever someone uses the word legget. You'll thank me later. He is, Christian T. Peterson is so much like George Lucas in that like. <laughs> this is his. Yeah. He's just, he has this crazy vision. Yeah. And you think that he hasn't done something, but he totally has. He just has done yeah. stuff. I don't know if this is still the only movie Final Fantasy or Fantasy Flight has ever done, Final but this, Fantasy I Flight. keep doing that. But <laughs> Fantasy, this was the first movie Fantasy Flight ever did. This they did. What was this? Two thousand nine, something like that. Mm-hmm. They had a big push of like we want to start to kind of like branch out. So if you go and you look up the trailer for Midnight Chronicles, it opens with Fantasy Flight presents. Wow, a film by to, Christian T. Peterson. Was it? Meant to promote a game? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. So Midnight is a role-playing system. Oh, I see. And Midnight Chronicles was supposed to build up hype for this role-playing system. Yeah. And they yeah. were trying. They were. They had planned to do more. Apparently, they were going right. to do other movies and stuff like that. They wanted to just get into cool little projects like that. So right there, the I, that guarantees that there at one point was a boardroom meeting where they talked about a TI movie. movie. Yeah. That absolutely. So if you're thinking that that was just a weird tangent we went on last week. There's Someday, some legit when we to talk him. to Christian T. Peterson, we're going to ask him about the day they talked about doing a T.I. Yeah. movie, because we know for sure that it happened, and he definitely has a design document, yes. and we're going to look at that someday, so we, and we're going to bring that to We you. can all project what we want to the movie to be, but Christian T. Peterson has a, an idea for us. There story. is a file yes. on the computer on... Written on MS-DOS. Written on MS-DOS, because Christian T. Peterson's old school like yeah, that. Yeah, man. Uh, so, oh my gosh, I can't, it blew me away. Yeah. I watched, I didn't watch the movie, but I watched, it's on YouTube. Just go on YouTube. You'll find it. It's on YouTube for free. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't sit down and watch all that. I watched it on double speed and was just kind of like tabbing through it. Right. The, the, the hook there being, there was rumor that Christian T. Peterson was in it. Like he did a cameo. He directed it and there's a little cameo of him. I didn't find him. If he's in there, he's probably dressed up as like an orc or something crazy. Or I just, I missed it. I was flying through it. Right, right. But oh, mama. Hey, if you guys want, we'll do a riff tracks of it. If you guys want, we will watch <laughs> Don't that. Don't promise that. I, I'm just saying, if you guys want it, if you guys want it, we'll do a riff tracks of that. I actually have some friends that do a riff tracks thing in town, oh and one of them's gosh. a really cool guy. We could have him over because he's an expert wow. at making movie riffs, and then me and you just kind of balance it out. I need to check in with Dane and just make sure Dane tells me that we are legally not allowed to do that. I need. Uh, we might. As, no, need. we're doing it. Um, <laughs> oh no. We'll we'll do that. Yeah, I mean, get it. Actually, the more excitement you guys can drum up with yeah, you guys right. wanting that the more matt will have to agree oh, to do man. it uh, all right what's the, who's the ne- next errata the from? next errata is from a user known as scooter who could that be uh, uh i who's, who's, i wasn't in the episode i got some stuff to say right all right uh, first off <laughs> hunter if i have to spend an entire day with you while you are dressed as a cat I'm gonna yorts. I'm gonna barf. I don't know I'm if you noticed, but my it. new thing is <laughs> to, to promise really to, to make things. big promises and then have to deliver. And uh, no, I promised I would wear a cat suit at. Uh, Where are you gonna get a cat suit? I'm. I'll buy one. This or, is not. You know what I'm I gonna want. do? I'm gonna buy cat ears and a bodysuit. There's a furry at, convention in Portland, isn't there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna. Well, I won't buy a furry suit, but I'll buy a, a kitty bodysuit thing <laughs> and some ears, and I'll have Sean, uh, who will be who will be with. He will make me into a cat. And okay, I actually I would commit to yeah. a fully costume stream if it was a, the next holiday stream. Yeah, with all our well, oh, we'll bugs. do that. But I also have to I'm do gonna it at be Gen Con. I'm just gonna be the Yeti. It doesn't need to be connected to a faction. Right, right. I'm gonna be I'm gonna we have a Yeti costume that right. I just want. 
to be in. Ooh, I got a lot of ideas for... Uh, anyways, <laughs> this is not important. Read uh, the rest of your also, stupid erotic. Yeah, you guys talked about eating hot dogs in a movie theater, and I just felt like it was really important to point out that's not a thing that happens, you, you idiots. You can get a hot dog. No one has theater. ever done that in the history of the but universe. you can get them, so they must be bought, No right? one is going to be that rude to stink up an entire <laughs> movie theater with a freaking yeah, hot dog if it was really relish. popular. <laughs> if it was just like... Movie theaters everybody. would be the worst place in the universe. There's just no feasible reason anyone would ever go to movies You're going to go see a movie someday, and it's just like, man, this is a real hot dog movie. Everybody in here is really... Pass me your relish. <laughs> dum, 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 dum. Play ball! Uh, also, uh, I just wanted to throw out that the Vanessa Redgrave, Redgrave shout-out that Hunter did, apropos of nothing, was... I honestly think that came more from Alex when we were You're the one the who said it. Though. Yeah, I kind of I I can't remember which one of us brought up Vanessa. Nothing Redgrave. has been a bigger McElroy moment. If if people draw comparisons of us to the McElroy brothers, which if you don't, that's fine. I, I feel good that you don't immediately compare us to them. But right, that's, well, they're not funny. Like well, they are. yeah, sure. But the the that's the most McElroy thing you've ever bringing up some B list. I don't know. I don't even know if Vanessa Redgrave is a B list actor. I don't know who she is. Yeah, and you are so gung ho <laughs> about pointing out that she needs to be in this movie. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, thanks, Alex. All right, we got one. We got one more errata, and this is an important one. So, Hunter, I want you to do it. All right. Uh, so this one is uh, from Stronkowski. Uh, on... Very active on our Discord. Right. Right. Uh, uh, and and what Stronkowski? So I don't I don't remember if you guys alluded to this or not, but this discussion was kind of brought up because in Meme Town on our Discord, Discord there was a conversation about what. Ti movie should right. be, and when we thought it was probably lost and nobody was going to, it's really hard go to dig through, through Discord right, to find right. old stuff. But Stronkowski did the Stronkowski work. did it. So here we go. Here is the actual movie. It's called Rifting the Mechatol. It is a classic '80s movie full of action, random shirtlessness, incredibly short shots, and cheesy one-liners. It starred Burt Reynolds as the sole commander <laughs> with the movie's most quotable line: "It looks like we'll have to go into the rift." <laughs> Rick Moranis stars as a goofy Hakan emissary. Some question the racial sensitivity of his accent. We don't even know what that means. Yeah. Um, Judge Reinhold. I love this is establishing the fact that th this is talking as though this movie already exists. Right, right. This was made. This was made in the 80s. In the 80s. Yeah, so yeah. Judge Reinhold is in the movie, obviously, and he plays a comedy relief Hylar scientist. A perfect role for Judge uh, Reinhold. Oh, of course, honestly. of course. Uh, Steve Martin is uh, in it as a starring role as a Letnev general. He injured his neck during the filming, went out in, and somehow went out in a blaze of glory when the Letnev flagship was destroyed by Exo Trireme. That's kind of just like some strategy so stuff specific. in there. Yeah. <laughs> Burt Reynolds sheds a single tear watching this as the two flagship captains had a form have formed a mutual respect by this point. Why are you giving Steve Martin such a serious commander Yeah, what? Role? And Burt Reynolds what is eight, the... What about 80 Steve Martin makes you think? Honestly, <laughs> dude, I don't see Burt Reynolds on stage and I'm... Or on screen and I'm just like, I trust this guy. <laughs> um, in addition to the Suicide Ram, Star Wars was also ripped off uh, as okay. there was a casino subplot that made no sense. Why would the Arborek even have a casino? <laughs> That's what it was. Um, John Cusack and Joan Cusack... <laughs> Had supporting roles as a Sardak and Mentak bridge officer, uh, respectively. It was a four-hour long movie, partially due to the previously mentioned casino subplot, <laughs> but also a useless SAR subplot about searching for a lost key. Sean Bean had a role as Reynolds XO and a straight man for the comedy bits. The character was killed off fairly early in the film. So there you have it. Like you do. That's the that's the real TV. Rifting movie. the Mechatol, classic <laughs> 80s movie. And I forget who all can. That was that. That was all designed by a bunch of people. Right. I mean, honestly, it is one of the funniest conversations that has ever happened on our Discord. Right. It's right. like I think Arch Thama Meme Town was there. Mm -hmm. Alex was there. I think Stronkowski was a part. Right. Of it. There right. was a bunch of people all just shooting ideas off each other. I have never seen no improv group in existence has like bounced off of each other as well as this stuff just came out. I mean, it was, it was back to back to back to back right, of right. just brilliant ideas after brilliant ideas. So. If it could always be that good, we could form a Twilight Imperium improv yeah. like <laughs> troupe. Yeah, where we only do T.I. jokes. <laughs> it's good. A real wow, how, that would have no place in this world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do some rundown. Yeah. 
uh, please go to Space Cats Pod at Space Cats Pod. That is on Twitter uh, for game updates. We do announcements. Uh, just you know, it's all the things that Twitter is for, which I still don't fully comprehend. It's right. fine. Uh, Facebook. We also do announcements on there. Uh, I also take questions if you Facebook message us on there. That's me. That's a direct line to me. You buzz me, and I'll answer your phones. I will. Gen- I, I'll see it too. I, well, Hunter sees it, but he never. I just look at you it. Just looks at it. Just same with our email, <laughs> spacecatspeaceturtles at gmail dot com. If you want to have, if you want to know Hunter, maybe probably looked at something, but have me respond. If to you, you message and say, "Hey Hunter, this is on," I, I will sure. respond. Sure. Uh, also, go to Reddit Twilight Imperium uh, for posts and to discuss this episode and uh, previous episodes. And, and that's how you get in the, the errata. And that's kind of the only way you're going to get in the errata is there or the Board Game Geek Guild, which has. The Board Game Geek Guild is getting pretty quiet. It's because Board Game Geek is a trash website that I will oh, never stop dunking oh, on for all time. But we need it. Uh, but we do need it. Uh, and We'd love to go to BGG Con. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, honestly, because uh, there are some people that are only on Board Game Geek, and I do love interacting with them. Right. It just stinks, it stinks that it kind of, we got split up like yeah. that. But yeah. whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, you can also contribute to us uh, on our Patreon patreon.com slash space cats peace turtles oh yeah and uh that is where you can contribute to episodes like this this was a galactic council episode if you want to be in the galactic council five dollars per month is all you have to do uh we want to throw this out we're, we're entering this is july now mm-hmm. uh august 2nd is the first day of gen con this patreon was originally designed with the intent of helping us do gen con if you don't have the intent of donating to us month to month. That's fine. The Patreon is still the best vessel. If you want to help us do this Gen Con thing, we would honestly like to put the call out this month, uh, kind of a pledge campaign of like, if you'll just donate to us one time to push us over that limit, we, we have uh, a good amount to get us started for Gen Con, but we, we need more and we want to get it to happen. So if you will donate to us, we'll, we will remind you. Our first episode of August, I, we will put the call out to say, hey, if you just wanted to do a one-time donation to help with Gen Con, here's your reminder to go go turn off your th- that Patreon because we don't want you to get billed twice. And sometimes people forget to turn off those types right, of subscriptions. Right. And we understand that. But if you want to help contribute to Gen Con, give us just one month. Uh, at whatever you want to donate, even a dollar helps. Um, so we, we just want to put that call out there to kind of push this as far as we can this month. So patreon.com slash spacecatspeaceturtles. You can also go to our Discord. The links are in the Reddit and the BGG threads. Um, it's really hard to post those anywhere else, honestly. Mm-hmm. Facebook is it, Facebook pages are designed horribly. I tried to put it as a link in our Facebook, and I just couldn't. What about our um, email? Uh, email? Well, you can email us, and I can send you the link. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, you skipped the email. Well, line oh, I mentioned it earlier. In the oh, email, you, you can send us plays of the weeks and yeah. This Imperium Life. Yeah. That's the best place to get those stories. We're always having the call out for This Imperium Life. Right. Uh, and, of course, we always need plays of the week. But Discord is where you can also get a bunch of your Patreon benefits. That's how we talk to people about what episodes we want to see upcoming. Uh, and it's also just where fun, stupid, crazy conversations happen. Like, basically the entire basis of last week's episode the only reason we talked about a ti movie is because of the crazy conversation that happened in meme town right uh so please come join us on discord uh finally give us a rating on itunes apple podcasts and any other app, app of choice uh it improves the visibility of twilight imperium and our show hunter i got some comedy stuff i want to throw at you uh you're gonna hear this on tuesday yeah tuesday like night normal tuesday this one's coming out a little yeah, bit this late one will probably guys, be a little sorry. bit late but tomorrow um, I will be at Kelly's Olympium with my sketch group called The Love Boys. Um, the show starts at 8.30. It's $5. Obviously, this is in Portland, Oregon. Um, and the other show I really want to tell you about uh, that's super fun, and in fact, um, oh my God, it was such a blast. The last one we had, we had 112 people wow. in a backyard. That's very awesome. Um, yeah, and uh, it is my show uh, that I run with uh, two friends of mine. It's called Comedy Party House Show Comedy. It happens in a backyard in North Portland. The address is 6346 North Maryland Avenue. The next one is going to be on July 28th at 8 p.m. It is free. Um, that will be days before we go to Gen Con. That is literally right. three days. Before oh, we go I to have. I, yeah, I'm going to have a lot of comedy stuff right up right leading up, up to lead it. Up. It's going to be really fun. Um, but yeah, please come check this show out. It's very special. It's the best thing that I do. July yeah. 28th, 8 p.m. Yeah. I will let you know about it again next week, obviously. But yeah, yeah. just putting that out there. Uh, I want to thank some Patreoners, Patreoners, as we so lovingly call them. Uh, this week, we want to give a shout out to Wagnius, Wagnius the Doggus. <laughs> The Venerable Zen Dog and Rear Admiral Chirano.
Thank yeah. you. Thank Thanks. you, thank you, thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thanks so much. Oh, you want to do the play of the week? Yep. I didn't get to do it last time because Alex was here. So I never get to do it anymore. <laughs> Go ahead. Go. Even other I'm, people come in is, and they're like... This is my gift to you, Hunter. <clears throat> play of the week. <clears throat> this is from Milty. We played a six-person game with co-op building and faction drafting. I cho- cho- chose a risky slice with Aranam Mir in front of my home system and Barrack Lurt of Four adjacent to that, but two anomalies on either side of my home system. I chose the Clan Asar, figuring I'd be able to move out quickly and not care about my home system. Unfortunately, I ended up next to the Ghost and Isarl, who both moved two spaces during round one to box me in. For four rounds, I fell behind. Stuck with only four planets, at the end of round four, I was at two victory points. I had two uncompleted secret objectives own four cultural planets, and own two faction technologies. During round five, I researched Floating Factory 2, my uh, faction tech, and finally uh, jumped a SAR ball across the map, letting me take seven mostly undefended planets. I scored four cultural planets and four planets of the same trait. During the agenda phase, the Ixthian artifact blew up Mechatol, and all my newly obtained influence allowed me to obtain a support for the throne from the ghost for stopping all wormhole systems from being activated. I was at five victory points. During round six, I grabbed Imperial and scored two points from moving my Sarball to a now empty Mechatol, playing Imperial and spending eight influence. All the planets I had taken had gotten me ten trade goods, and I had both of my faction techs. During the status phase, I completed the stage two public and my secret objective to win the game. Moral of the story? Never leave empty planets for the SAR to take. Yeah. This is such a different it's take. the opposite of the story you always hear. Yes, I love which it. Which is that SAR got shut down. Ixian Artifact came up, and ah, oh, SAR was sitting on Mechatol, and it blew Ooh. up. No. Yeah. That's not what happened this no. time. Yeah. This is a SAR that came back from some big losses. Just never. That just never happened. About that. This is, yeah. I love this. This is this is honestly this is one of my favorite SAR stories we've yeah. ever got. It's contrary to the overall narrative that we have for yeah. the SAR, which is completely insane. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so to close out the show this week, it's actually going to be a weird uh, send off uh, because I'm going to get a little bit serious for just a moment. But I wanted to do this because last week I wasn't on the show, and some people were very confused by that. And Hunter gave me a lovely little uh, uh, thing. He 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 was very nice. And it made everyone else very, very nice to me. Uh, I wasn't on the show last week because we had some things going on in our family. And I felt like it was weird to have that as just like a mystery in the community. And I didn't Mm -hmm. want it always kind of being in the background. I didn't like the idea of this being this like lingering presence of people being like, what's going on with Matt? Right. So I just, I'm not going to talk about it very long. Um, But uh, my father-in-law who is someone Hunter and I have both known for many, many, many years, mm-hmm. like 11 years, and uh, Hunter roasted him at my wedding. I, may, I got him good. Got him good. At <laughs> your wedding. Uh, he passed away last week, um, and very, very tragic. Um, so I was. that's why I wasn't here. Uh, it's also going to lead to some changes in the future for the show. That's a little bit more down the road. But uh, I just really appreciated everyone sending their thoughts and mm-hmm. you know whatever else everyone does it was it was very nice um i know laura organized some people to kind of write up a, a nice letter <laughs> due to some crazy circumstances i could never get that letter have no idea why it was stolen it. from my front porch but i still really do appreciate everyone who kind of in the background of our discord was making that happen uh i just re- you guys have all been very 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 kind uh i was afraid of even bringing anything up like this because I thought we'd get a bunch of weird backlash of like, oh, what? So Matt's just taking a week? I don't know. I was just afraid of weird people mm-hmm. saying stupid things, but that didn't happen at all. Everyone was amazing. So just thank you so much for being a really great community. This is this is always one of the highlights of my week, and uh, I, I want to give a big, big thank you. And honestly, it's really insane that uh, the com- this community is uh, as good as it is, you know? Like, yeah. we're a bunch of people... That all know about this board game, but we're also just a bunch of random people on the internet. Right. And you've all spent time on the internet, and you all know how what that goes. That can be most of the time, and yeah. it's kind of insane that so many of you are are so sweet and so kind. And I can't believe how awesome especially over so many like, of you are. The topic of our discussion is usually this game where it's usually people just at each other's throats. Right. And it, that's the thing about Twilight Imperium that's so amazing is like the point of the game is to like you know the joke is it ruins friendships, but it absolutely doesn't like. 
surviving the raw emotions of Twilight Imperium brings you closer to people. And that's why we love it so much. Right. That's why we love doing this show. So thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. Yeah. 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 What a game. What a game. What a game. Thank you for listening to Space Cats Peace Turtles. And thanks to Ben Prunty for the use of his music. You can find more at benpruntymusic.com and benprunty.bandcamp.com. Pax Magnifica Bellum Gloriosum.